believe that it was something that I had requested. Hi, can, can folks hear me okay? Um, is that better? How's, how's this? Is that much better? Much better. Much better. Wonderful. Um, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to the return of Poetry and Prose. Uh, tonight, featuring Ecopoetics of the Gulf, Poetry and Cinepoem, sponsored by UH's Creative Writing and Graphic Design Program. My name is Emily Deal. I serve as Researcher Services Librarian for Special Collections at UH Libraries. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening at Trillius. Uh, this is the first time we've been able to gather together in a really long time, and it feels good. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to thank a few uh, folks uh, for helping make tonight happen. So Giuseppe Torino and Alex Parsons of the Creative Writing Program and Christensen from English, Adele Williams for all of her help coordinating this event. She is really a superstar here, yes. And a huge thank you to the communications team at the libraries, Mauricio Lazo and Esmeralda Fisher who enabled live streaming of the event tonight. I'd also like to take a moment to thank and acknowledge Carolyn Meanley who has served as events coordinator at the libraries for many years and is, I'm sure, a familiar face to those of you who attend Poetry and Prose regularly. Uh, Carolyn has been part of Poetry and Prose since its beginning over 20 years ago. Uh, and I think it's safe to say that none of us would be here sharing the space together tonight were it not for her and um, all of uh, her hard work over the years. Um, Carolyn will be retiring from the library uh, next month, so I just wanted to take a moment to express our gratitude and appreciation for all that Carolyn has done uh, for the uh, libraries and for poetry and prose. Um, and I am not the only one who would like to express gratitude uh, to Carolyn tonight. So Martha, do you want to come on up? Carolyn, you too. Your turn. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm here on I'm here on behalf of the English department and to um, the creative writing program uh, to thank you for everything you've done for the literary arts for all the ways that you've supported our students for so long. Um, uh, I just uh, it's really really moving the dedication that you've shown and I'm here with Caitlin Rizzo. Uh, the graduate advisor at Glass Mountain, who has a word to say as well. Yes, and for many years, um, she and me have helped us organize Gold Space and our launch events, and it's just, I just wanted to say thank you so much on behalf of Glass Mountain for helping us continue this lineage and, and being such a beacon of service and literary community. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> and oh, thank, thank you. Well. Oh my goodness. What is this? Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. It's really been my pleasure this whole time, actually it's almost 22 years, because when an idea is acted upon, something very noteworthy or even magical can happen. And that actually occurred back in 1999. Our English librarian, Ani Yusefi at the time, had an idea of something literary to do. Our dean at the time, Dana Rooks, liked it. We also had um, Dr. John Leinhart of Engines of Our Ingenuity fame. He actually named Poetry and Prose. So we had a lot of a good group of people uh, early on also. Uh, 
Bob Phillips was a big supporter. And a couple things I just have to tell you, because you won't believe it anyway, is that when it first started, <laughs> we had wine at all of our events. That maybe went on for two or three years until I guess the Board of Regents decided we should be careful about serving wine on the campus, <laughs> and they changed the rules. And also, when once we got back here after all the renovation in the 2004, 2005, in addition as this was, uh, Dean uh, Bill Monroe and former Dean Ted Estes would often make coffee for us. So it's been a wonderful group with creative writing, English department, uh, honors, and us. Sometimes in the some of the earlier days, Mark Doty, maybe some of you have heard of him, he really would help me out at times because I might need somebody, someone had to drop out or something, and he'd say, Carolyn, I'll come and read if I can be first, and I could leave without having any conversation later, because he was going to the airport <laughs> to catch a plane, usually to Europe. So we've always had this kind of great, good feeling going on. We've gone through uh, people, Edward Lukasek was involved very much, Julie Grove from Special Collections uh, was English librarian at the time, and she did that too. We've had just fabulous, fabulous support from the Creative Writing Program, and it's been so neat to, to see uh, the students come in and the extreme talents that they have. And I've always enjoyed also, what had been usually in September, our new faculty, so we could highlight them, and the students would have the opportunity to come in and meet with them and uh, see the kind, of, hear the kinds of work that they were doing. So it's, it's been our pleasure. It's always been our pleasure, and I've always looked forward to this so much, along with Glass Mountain and then Boldface and all these things. So just thank you so very much. You gave me a chance to play for about 22 years, and I thoroughly enjoyed every moment of it. Thank you so much, um, Carolyn. Um, now I'd like to invite Martha back up uh, to send off Carolyn on a high note. Uh, she'll introduce our readers for this evening. First, let me say I have the booster flu, so I'm not really, not really ill. Um, I'm Martha Serpass. Um, I teach poetry writing in the creative writing program, um, and for many years now, um, the course in Echopoetics in the Gulf and uh, Cheryl Beckett's uh, graphic design class have collaborated to make uh, these cinepoems. Uh, and when we started, um, I'm not sure that cinepoems was, a, was a, a, a word in common use. So before we get to that, um, I just want to tell you a word about Echopoetics in the Gulf and um, tell you about an event um, that will be happening over in art and then introduce the poets in Echopoetics will be uh, reading for you before the cinepoems are shown. Um, Houston is not just Montrose. That was, that was an, an initial, um, initial push for this, for this class. Um, we live near a very important estuary, Galveston Bay, and I think uh, that's probably becoming more and more apparent to us over the years. Echo Poetics uh, is a course in praxis, and I also am convinced that where we write is important to what we write, no matter what we write about. So Echo Poetics involves uh, excursions out into the marsh, kayaking, bird watching, um, uh, lectures about marsh and um, shore ecology. Because of Hurricane Ida, we didn't get to go to our usual um, marine lab um, in Louisiana, where we usually go out in a boat and get, you know, get to hang with marine biologists, et cetera. Um, but we did, um, we did go to um, ground zero of Hurricane Ida, um, I would say, what, about six weeks after the storm hit. Um, and the students were amazing with um, donated supplies, et cetera, and also seeing what a totally destroyed barrier island looks like and what that would mean for New York and New Jersey um, and every state along the way, um, most especially the rest of Louisiana um, when future storms hit.
I'm going to introduce the poets who are going to read in the order that they're going to read. And this, this truly was an amazing class. I'm sure I've said that before, but really, this was an amazing class. And um, the collaboration wasn't just between graphic design and creative writing. It was also within the class. And so to, to give you that experience, I'm asking each one of them to come up, um, read for a few minutes, and then um, allow the next person to come so that you're really experiencing um, um, one collaboration of, of poetry. Maha Abdelwahab holds an MFA in poetry from the University of Oregon. Her work has appeared in the Adroit Journal, Rusted Radishes, The Recluse, and elsewhere. She's interested in spirituality, the politics of culture, and the intersections of those two. Addie Eliadis was a 2019 Fulbright Scholar in Brazil, teaching English and leading a poetry workshop. A University of Virginia graduate, Addie received the University of Virginia's 2017 Rachel St. Paul Poetry Prize. She's an MFA student in poetry with an Imprint C. Glenn Camber Fellowship at the University of Houston. Gabriela Adriana Iancono is a poet and artist from Staten Island, the borough of Parks in New York City. She's a C. Glenn Camber Imprint Fellow and was a recipient of the 2016 May Apple Fellowship. Iancono worked in public education for seven years before moving to Houston and currently teaches creative writing for writers in the schools. She recently coordinated the 2021 Boldface Conference for Emerging Writers and served as a graduate advisor to the University of Houston's undergraduate literary magazine, Glass Mountain. Stephanie Pashaw is a writer from Los Angeles with an MFA in fiction from the University of Montana. Her work has been published in Diagram, Narrative, Joyland, The Believer, The Master's Review, Mississippi Review, and is upcoming in New Ohio Review. Uh, I have to mention that two students who took the class are primarily fiction writers. Stephanie's one of them, just saying. Um, Faye Aikamba, I don't think is with us tonight. Is that right? Um, Eris Kiyun is a Houston enthusiast and a student of abolition. Her poems are published with the West Review, Rumpus, Right About Now, and elsewhere. She's a Pushcart nominee and a 2020 Best of the Net finalist. She ranks number 10 in the 2020 Women of the World Poetry Slam and pursues her MFA in creative writing at the University of Houston. Zarlash Niaz is a writer and organizer from Minneapolis, Minnesota, whose work focuses on immigrants' rights and women's rights. She is currently an MFA candidate in poetry at the University of Houston and a founding member of the nonprofit Afghan Re Refugee Aid. Adele Elise Williams is a writer, editor, and educator from Baton Rouge, obsessed with bad women, theology, and powerlessness. Her work appears or is forthcoming in the Florida Review, Cream City Review, Adroit Journal, Beloit Poetry Journal, Split Lip, and elsewhere. Maha. Hi everyone, can you guys hear me? Okay, awesome. Um, thank you for coming tonight. I was told to like not give any disclaimers, so I'm just gonna get right into it. Reading Frank O'Hara in Giza. I forget the special circles and dented griefs of a name, but the Sphinx was once an unnamed thing. It takes a romantic to leave the city, writes Hedda. No one told me I'd run out of places to leave. I'm American, which means I took my time without having time to take. Without my sister, I fell for the easiest thing I could find, a gray-haired drug dealer with two yawning kids. Not him, the kids. The way they split their mouths at our ugly jokes about women's bodies, and how could we do that to them? I quit everything I thought I'd mastered. I never wanted the flesh, writes Ocean. Me neither. But what I did with it was no less than cruel. There was enough dust in the air to bury a body but other pyramids and other sleeping nations outnumber us. We were only just beginning to know the iron lick of life. Plastic water bottles, camel heads, and white tourists. 
Ten years later, my sister stomped ice in Boston, and I forced tears under Douglas fur. Always a boy. Always a city whose hands cut the eaves of me like no boy ever could. Brown-Eyed Girl was the song we played while my best friend believed Van Morrison was dead. I refused to tell her. I wanted to know something first. In a taxi ride on the way to the airport, a recovering addict confesses she doesn't get why the two of us are poets. The two of us. What's the difference between singing something and saying it, she asks. The difference. You drink the Kool-Aid. You forget that it was French archaeologists who dug us up. And then you remember. And you still sing. And look for a sparkle in the blood we call money. The bruise we call dance. Doesn't she know? Before the word, there was just the sound of sycamore trees shedding their endless skin. Thank you. I want to name a bird I do not own. In this roomless room of the outside, I create more room. I think of language as a closed system of errors, ineffable comprehension. Then, this blue-black crow, no, I mean grapple, with its flattened paper wings, its flippant bouncing head, signaling both the first and last of fear. We feed it, and arrogance is compelled to create the story of a nameless bird, to thrust a name upon it. Yes, me, whose body does not yield, who is still afraid to touch the marsh, to seethe and to swarth. Yes, me, slack-jawed at the water dancing inside us, converting sea foam green to baby blue. I am both essential and not, in my noticing and not noticing, in my needing to be a part of, woven in. Yes, I want the cardinal intelligence of no thought. I want, I want, I want. And after desire, what holds? Thank you. Event boundary on the patio. The moth can't remember why she entered the room away from the flower. She masquerades as a butterfly under the aid of daylight. Task A has already been discarded, but what was task B again? It hovers on the cusp. Task B has already been discarded. Everywhere is threshold. You must not see it. Until she lands on a petal, porch perfume will have to do, propel her wings, and steer her antenna in all the wrong directions toward the same nightlight. Tea time with Nani. I touch a finger to my lips, the cue for Nani and me to bow our heads, close our eyes, and hush. Our secret to polished silver and earl gray. She blesses the family I count like sheep in grandfather clock rhythm. My mouth waters from the lanos and their crepe cup poise as my eyelashes in squint scope filter antique sunlight flooding the window, pouring all over the tea set, shedding her prayer to flush, dust to dust, her face powder once she opens her eyes and smiles into a blush. Spaghetti Western. You could say I left town for the both of us. Life with you was special in part because it was rare to begin with. The fistful of nights we played poker by candlelight or danced in the kitchen before dinner would be worth pure gold in a gunmetal auction. I'm a daughter. How could I not choose my mother to follow down the forked road of your divorce? The barbecue of resentment could put a moonshine and rattlesnake venom cocktail to shame. But when the saloon walls collapsed, there were no bandanaed bandits, no terracotta cattle storming the yard, but I had to shoot at the drop of a 10-gallon hat. If I missed, I missed very well. The props of your fatherhood, a cushioned box of cufflinks, your good and plenties, a watch you keep on its side, a spit cup for your renegades, and your father's old briefcase, briefcase smell like snakeskin and shoe shine. Tree frogs. No need to comb through your oil slick mind. I'm well aware of my bearings where my silhouette swells for you. These decimal kisses won't cut it. This heart, once put away, bankrupt by sleep, now kindles. As the dark evening quickens, 
It needs flicker of cable jump in tropical rainstorm. I want you to the other side, spirals of time compressed and released. Want to ride the swerves of a mountain highway, the whistle and faint shoot me fresh out of air. Tree frogs will sing through interludes of dew. A houseplant will shimmy in its cracked pot. Securities. I would prefer not to. Bartleby from Bartleby the Scrivener. Not everyone's epiphanies come in concussions, although that shit's fun to read about. Take Newton's delirium. Mass times acceleration. Mass times acceleration. Just wait for the day. It'll hit you like a falling apple. The Windows theory has been broken for a long time. One, it's married to stockbrokers. Two, inertia yields graffiti upon graffiti walls, all you can see from this office building, and gives birth to legitimate crimes. Securities is a fresh and ever refreshing market. That's why Ivy League econ grads work Wall Street. Business is best kept private in their domain. Let the monogrammed ticker tape speak for itself. When numbers are down, you go home and, like a suicidal soprano, play hangman with the newsreels. Thank you. Ephemer Island. Read this when the city plans a wholesale store on your wetlands, when they've chased out the skunk and snake, as they erect condos under cemeteries, as they push the bodies in plots back for a leasing office. Grant yourself permission to slump back behind the headstones and all. Then read this before everyone goes out, before sundown when the world is still walking their dogs and cats and kids and all grow tired and all unharnessed. Read this if you see a skull strapped to a rabbit's back or when the toads play a requiem on a fiddle or while you browse your emails for shopping promotions or while the dog is hospitalized and the dad is put to bed or while the gas company is burning its waste like an artisan match. Read this while you paddle across glaciers with your bulk paper towels and boxes of cocktail wieners and banquet-sized sheet cakes and as the bouquets are being laid down. Tugging. When I was young, my sister would wash my back for me, scrubbing where I couldn't reach. Sometimes I would pull open the glass door, join her under sheets of water. I had a fear of water, of drowning in a microfall, of a folklore witch dragging me down the drain. Our mother would let me wash alongside her. I would scrub with the suds I caught from her breast and side, her womb, my exit. She had so much unmarked softness. I didn't know how to swim until I was 12 years old and would panic under every rinse. My cousin once tried to drown me in a lake upstate. She pretended to have fallen, tugged me at my wrist, played pregnant mermaid with my head clutched beneath her shirt. I still can't trust my compulsive breath or let go of my nose when it comes time to plunge again. I remember tumbling in a wave on the coast of Florida while my family leaned over melon. The ocean floor clogged my ears. I can still hear it wailing loudly, lunging a millennia's crest at me as if I caused its stickle erosion. A storm, sur a storm surge is apathetic, I suppose. I've watched the Atlantic swell and swallow a hook forever, and I think of that boy who held a hose to my face, his meekness laid on his lawn near the grove. I'm older now, and when I stare up at a gulf storm, the sideways sheets of rain breaking the sky open, I remember looking up from under, and my mother's anger becomes too slippery to hold on to. city reconstitutes itself in a void. We acclimate to our new surroundings like babes in our bassinets, each crack on the sidewalk rattling our minds like canned spaghetti. 
Every corner of my block has turned into someone else's alfresco church or cash checking joint or another convenience store. Dogwoods planted half a century ago are stumped. Daycares dilapidate amid rows of condos and the garden store is being paved into a parking lot. Newness is in our nature, a poisonous and pointless bush. We meander through the city. We look for jungle gyms, sets of monkey bars. We find the ground gaping at us instead, welled and widened like a mother postpartum. We find for sale or development signs, zip tied to rented fences. We look in ditches to disappoint ourselves. We are no longer children playing archeologist in the dull, dull sand. We are only imparting a flicker of an archive. Thank you. The Sock Protectorate. 100,000 miles of blood embrace your brain. Imagine getting on a train and circling the earth. Now do it again and once again. That long, sublime, and sanguine tangle homes what lets you breathe. It brings a blush. It flushes out the tiny, bitter things that seep and seek to bloom with bad ambitions. It turns the cogs that then control cognition. If I could climb inside your skull unnoticed, entering a nostril or an ear or the hole through which come tears, I'd hitchhike those miraculous flood highways to all your oscillating hemispheres. As things remain, it seems I'll have to stay outside your red-wrapped brain. I'll thank instead the body for doing what it does without instruction. Upon its sleek white scaffolding, construction of a breed untaught, unspeaking, immunities advancing, white cells seeking what would harm you. If it were in my power, I would overarm you. Certain drugs provide diminishing returns. Occasionally, forests need to be deliberately burned. Better then that I am helpless to do much of anything, but bless and think and marvel at the body and what happens in its darkness. If it works, it works so quietly well that there is no real telling. Maybe a subtle swelling behind the neck or a double check of red-veined eyes at night. And then the silent fight from which you will emerge purged unknowingly of tiny deaths, allowed for now the luxury of breath. It's bloodless, unrelenting, microscopic, not quite the topic for aperitifs or work, and like we do, it just persists. That's love if I have to call it something, the way your body kills for you. So quiet you can sleep through pocket wars, so resolutely built to be ignored, that's what I think must be meant by a door. The discipline of all the troops amassing and passing through your vessels with a surreptitious grace. They charge, surround, erase. You yawn. You drink a glass of wine. You thread gold silk into a braid. Meanwhile, a cellular crusade to salve and heal. It's a real unsung hero type of deal. Um, this one's called Contrails. Our compasses fail us again and again, leading us along the wrong magnetic fields, yet we sail still through quiet seas under the false mathematics of north. What the frontier means, not conquering, not masculinity, not like the blank boxes on a calendar, not the space between numbers on the face of a clock. It'll always be like this, the knots that tie me to this real world permanently straining. I'll never wander, like you, so sure of its geography. I feel old like the things that grow in mineral clumps on the inner skin of caves, things that have taken a million years to bring forth crystals. The stairs to the beach go down and keep their going down. The waves keep crawling up to palm trees, exhaling salt. In the sky, the flight attendants serve Bloody Marys in plastic cups and tilt their necks for a glimpse of the ocean. Thank you. Parade. Wet atoms collide and I come into seeing, soaking, amassing, moistening. Amidst twisting mists, I bear witness to other nearby births. 
This is the saturation of my many sky white siblings. Our graying mother forms with us, fashions us a home, a faucet room. From a, a wisp of dew dense fog, she begets a bosom body above, strains to cup and carry her litter of glistening pitter patter couplets. We, her huddling cloudlings, strain swollen and distended. We peek down at our peril over our precipice and wonder our impending end. Far below us, I see you, parter pauper, fuss to push your pity procession. I do not jump, I drop. Sometimes I dream of polythene. I am she in those dreams, flushed ashore yet blushing with remorse, tracing my path within her runnelled skin. I wonder vainly what a croony fortune could have been, only to land on answers we can't handle. Most times I shake awake before our starkest hour, before we've drowned the ocean whole, all alone and all at once. Thank you. Before I start, it's necessary to honor and acknowledge the land of the people through which these poems have come to be. The Kawankawa, Sana, and Atakapa people are the traditional inhabitants of both my home and my university's grounds, of which were brutally taken through the imperial violence of the United States. I'd like to recognize these indigenous populations so as to contextualize our current existence and the materials we create upon colonized territories. Land Acknowledgement 3. Let me begin again. All that good gold knows not what we have stoned it into, but we do. What we've slated between the brick, bright with monopoly dollar bills and a barrel down the throat, I know what this is. Why we beef more than we bison, pile drive our history into headstones head first and choked at the neck, make no mistake. I don't wonder how Sugarland gained its name. I know about Arcola, that breathing monument of a brutal beginning, how Siena is 17 minutes from Darrington unit. Did you know the whole city of Rocheron runs its wires, the miles between the prison and the plantation? We brush our teeth in magnesium, dust the sucrose from under our shoes. This shuck and jive circle suck still can't pronounce Karankawa. Still can't say slave without tasting the sweet. See what we've made of this land. Fields of sugarcane still swaying in the southern wind. We utter their names with no assortment of rock roses, no cone flowers, no consequence, just the rot of our teeth with the lick of our tongues, a calcified reparation hanging off the jaw. This poem's called The Coastline Ends Here with an epigraph from G.E. Patterson. And here we lie on our backs, neither eating nor talking watching the sky. And what if we do return in three years or five or God forbid 10 when the grass has grown below our feet and the seawall has surged so great we carve out squares to see through it again. I thought preservation meant keeping what was there, the roseate spoonbills and the ruby-throated hummingbird, hummingbird but perhaps it meant the moment itself. You won't recognize it when you come back, I hear, and I soak in the hush that falls over the water since we knew there was something we were never getting back. I trace the too many alien patterns in the sky, the clouds, names that escaped me, Stratus and Cirrus. Still, the moment so quick, I didn't even know I was watching it pass. 
I've never been any good at endings or wanting to end or returning or wanting to return. Thank you. Maud. I asked what she loved most about him. We looked down at our empty cup, a relic of faded Prussian blue. Plump fingers snatch at her veils, keeping them in place. I know what she wants. So I quickly fill the pot with rocks and pour. Between us sits silence under us an octet rug, and in her hands the cup, all she needs. She watches me. From the corner of her eye to make sure I don't leave, and I imagine her asking where I'm going. She sips tight-lipped, exercising her tongue under the weight of each pebble. And I want to tell her to the sky so it can drop me somewhere new, but she stops the conversation when she stares into her empty cup. I might have thought she was reading, instead she says, the best thing about your grandfather was I never looked at his flaws, and I pour more. Occupied. A war-torn country covers like a sheet of undyed wool, thick, boundless, fibrous. Every move is a tear, crawl, stumble, grip, and stand. No, crawl, grip, stumble, then stand, stay standing. Like a strand of unfiltered cloud thinner, the wool stretches to wrap next to ankles, turning skin against skin, ripping, stretching, floating, and stroking, and stroking, and stroking. Lunchtime. There's a constant desire for my body, all squished, ankles in too tight socks. They call me perfect bait, and I learn to stop swatting at the touch. Sharp, serrated edges slide into me. They think I don't notice. But I keep mixing soap, sugar with water. Soap, when I forget my last name, a drop of blood is pulled from my body and they flee before I see my mother wobble. Her eyes tilt, always looking for something to turn on. Parents use current events to scare us. Knife in left hand, tomato in right. She slices guts spilling onto white bread. She tosses goldenrod over mayonnaise and in a whisper that feels like a shriek says, get those runners. She watches the TV, sigh, groan, cry, never shriek. Wait, my parents are current events used to scare us. I whisper, scream, thank you, and feel another drop of blood pulled from my body, sandwich at hand, a bite re reveals what I've always wanted. A black spot, wings and straw, feeding me both petals. Before it can fly, I open wide and swallow bowl. My mother turns up the TV. She can't have known what I've done. Arms will be petals. Body will be home. Field notes. As if the humble colors could change our lives, as though we'd give up our comfort. The prairie grasses taller than our erratic egos, our own lineated confessions. How after the knee deep, the bitten ankles, we think we've done the work for that day, that week, and we're sorry, we always are. But we don't really want the wiki nature, that slippy mirror. Let me speak for myself. Marsh mama could stuff this mouth with coastal bowls, freckle my hair in Chinese tarot, and I'd still sell my face for green money. I'd objectifies the shame. Not if, but when. Catastrophe waits under our feet, and we cannot cast prayer at geological fates. There is no amount of money to stomp nature's wildness. As flesh and bone, we seek solution. 
but the world can be Delphic, clear as the mud we bury in. A tsunami isn't as tall as it is wide, but it is as wide as the earth is sprawl. A lazy forearm sweeping flour from the counter, my shower toll rubbering wet towards the drain. Natural disaster relies on a single faded moment, a geographic display of fuck. Perhaps the wind is simply too wet, or one tectonic plate throws up its hands. We can control our bodies only in any space. We cannot brighten the sun, lengthen the day. And there is everything human to compare this beast to, this earth we insist on calling mother, wanting so badly to humanize nature's unpredictability to price its purchase point. But the truth is, one can only run from water and mothers don't have to love. Nature is no place to root for values. It's wilderness harboring original sin, our bodies victim to a pitiful promise, a creeping thing, be it slither or the need for control. Look, this world will end all at once and it will feel familiar. Hello. So um, uh, Martha asked me to come and introduce uh, the class, uh, graphic design students. And um, this is part of uh, their senior final year. And uh, unlike Martha that's offering a course called Eco Poetry or Eco Poetics, uh, this is part of their sort of general all round um, coursework. But what was nice about working on this is that it gave the students an opportunity to work an entire semester on sort of one topic that um, was very sort of near and dear to us, um, but also to um, look at research both from a, a data, data perspective, but also to be allowed to go out into the spaces and um, experience kind of firsthand um, the environment that surrounds us. And, um, I don't know how you all work, but um, they tend to be in their studio uh, with their computer right there. And um, research to them, I think, speaking for you all, re research for them is often what they get from, um, again, looking sort of online. And so um, we did have an opportunity to go to um, Baton Rouge and to go to New Orleans. And of course, we are surrounded by the bayous and the waterways, the Gulf, and estuaries and wetlands. And so it gave them an opportunity to look, uh, again, both outside of this kind of digital world. And we also um, work with language. As graphic designers, we're always working with language. And um, I like to tell them that you know it's a, it's, it's a, a much easier position when the writing is really rich, deep, wonderful. Um, and that's not always what we can do. So it's a, a real pleasure to work with authors where you actually get to kind of uh, think the whole world very differently through this unique language. So we are honored to be able to work on these um, <laughs> cine poems, which they tease me because I can never pronounce it, but um, <laughs> sin, sin, I always remember sin, um, cine poems where they got to um, merge together this beautiful language with um, video and imagery. And um, unlike Martha that gave these wonderful um, bio bi biographies of their um, students, I will call them on their first name basis because I can't remember everybody's last name even though I just looked at them today. So if you could stand up, there's Diego in the back. <laughs> Francisco, Zach, Lexi, and Andrea. And then there's their friends. No, they're the rest of their classmates. Oh, Stephen and Stephen. <laughs> Thank you. 
For eons, marshes have responded to sea level changes and flooding by building elevation. As organisms die and add to the biomass at the base of the marsh, they also move inland to higher ground. This time, human development on land and changing topography may inhibit their migration. For eons, marshes responded by building biomass. This time, development on land. The marshes change and flood as organisms die, and they also develop land and change their ion. Eons respond and add. 
also moved ground and changed the migration of the land on land they read. Change time in the Inquisition. Cavernous and glowing, full and possible. Black crown, my hair dappled, diamonded, my eyes muddy. To speak of clouds is to over prepare, bulbous, luminescent, a slink and spore of grass. 
Humility as reconciliation, ground as strength. The gift, the burn, continues. Seeing is not an act, but an enactment. Sequestering carbon like a woman. Periwinkle snails who eat their own making. Circles of sustenance. Pollinators, droning waves. Stilling migration, proboscis plunge. Carried over the highway with ethos, crushed to dust by pollen. There's a window between hummingbird and human. Sing, sing. Raw thistle, bigot, finger. Water jugglers are music tracks. Thank you so much. Um, I would just like to say thank you to all the artists um, for sharing their work with us this evening and for giving us a reason to come together. Thank you so much. Um, and yes. And thank you all for attending. Um, have a good night. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, take care of each other. Good night. <laughs>